For context, this interview was recorded in June of 2020 amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. We all want a business like Netflix or Amazon Prime. Businesses where once a customer engages with them, it becomes automatic and part of their lifestyle from then on. But how do you build that forever transaction? Robbie Kelman Baxter has been studying subscription and membership models for nearly 20 years. And in this podcast, she uncovers the secrets and strategies of the membership economy. Join us for subscription stories, true tales from the trenches. Welcome to the show. It's your host, Robbie Kelman Baxter, sharing subscription stories with you. And today's guest is Daniel McCarthy. Dan is an assistant professor of marketing at Emory University's Goizueta School of Business. Among other things, he's an expert on valuing companies by focusing on the lifetime value of their customers, a novel approach at the intersection of marketing and finance. His approach, which has won him many accolades, is known as Customer-Based Corporate Valuation, or CBCV. His approach values companies from the bottoms up by predicting what those companies' customers will do in the future. Think very thoughtfully about unit economics and don't ignore the growing body of evidence for why it matters for their ultimate valuation. Uh, You really can't escape it, so you might as well be upfront about it and use it as a tool to be the heat-seeking missile that you use to measure and manage the value of your company over time. Dan's research has been accepted and published in top-tier academic journals, as well as nearly every major financial publication from HBR to the Financial Times to CFO Magazine. In 2015, he co-founded a predictive analytics company, Zodiac, which was later acquired by Nike. Dan subsequently co-founded Theta Equity Partners to commercialize his work on CBCV, Customer-Based Corporate Valuation. We're gonna be talking about why customer lifetime value is such an important and misunderstood metric, how to rethink the way companies are valued by the public markets, and what all of this means for subscription businesses. Since we're recording in June of 2020, we're going to discuss corporate valuations in times of great market volatility as well. Welcome to the show, Dan. It's great to be here with you, Robbie. Let's let's dive right in. Can you explain customer-based corporate valuation for the layperson? A customer-based corporate valuation at its most basic level is an enlightened way of forecasting a company's future revenues, uh, but driving that revenue forecast off of what the customers will do. So hopefully it's pretty intuitive that pretty much every major uh, valuation method starts with some sort of a revenue forecast. And the main thing that we would say is uh, every dollar of revenue has to come from a customer who's making a purchase. So if I can just take these best in class marketing science models for how customers are acquired over time, how long they stay with the firm, the orders they place and the amount that they spend, that's gonna give me unique insight into what that future revenue stream is gonna look like that might've been hard if I didn't have all that customer level visibility. And so we're just gonna kind of exploit that accounting identity for all that it's worth and bring all that marketing into our financial model. Can you talk a little bit about what what was missing before? What is the value of this, that, you know, what you call that marketing information that was missing from past methods of, of valuing businesses? Yeah, so oftentimes, you know, call it 30 years ago, we just didn't have that view of, of, of the customer and what the customer is doing over time. And so our valuation method, you know, we could, we would know that customers are going to be placing those orders, but if we can't actually see what anyone's doing, we can't actually incorporate that into our model. And so if we can't do that, we're gonna rely on everything else that we do have access to. We know the number of stores that we have. We know, basically, if I'm uh, extending loans, I know the number of loans that I'm, I'm, I'm passing out to consumers. Basically, I'm gonna take whatever I can get to, to, to put it into my model. But you know, if I don't have that customer level data, I really can't do this approach. I'd say the big thing that's changed over the past, you know, call it 20 years is 
we suddenly have this really nice uh, view of what the customers are doing, whether it's data coming in through through digital, you know, that we can now track and tag what customers are doing online much better than we ever could in, in physical stores. Uh, but even within physical stores, we're doing a much better job of, of being able to trace back those purchases to uh, specific customer IDs. And so, yeah, it just opens up a, a whole new world of possibilities for, for methods like this. Yeah, because what I remember, I mean, my my job between years of business school for a, a brief nanosecond, I worked in investment banking, uh, doing value, doing value. I, I it was not it was not the place for me. Although I'm sorry you for know. you, <laughs> <laughs> I spent many many days crying in the bathroom. Um, but that's a that's another story. Uh, but you know, one of one of the things that that we we did is we we tried we valued businesses, and a lot of times, as you said, we were valuing it based on you know. Well, if last year this store, the average revenue for this store was X and we're opening three new stores, then our revenue is going to be 4X, right? Because we have four stores um, or whatever it is. And so assuming that every store would have similar revenue, even though let's say the customer behavior might be different, the type of customer coming in might be different. Maybe the early customers that come into a store are different than the ones who come in over time or return and become more profitable. And so I think when you when you talk about the data that we have now, part of it is about the the accessibility of that data. And I think part of it is about a changing mindset among businesses to think more and understand more about how the customer, each individual customer's behavior impacts that rolled up quarterly revenue number or rolled up annual revenue number. And I think that's exactly right. And it's actually a really good analogy because you know, if you start playing it out right now, uh, you can see how it just is, is different now that uh, you might have a company like, you know, Walmart or, um, you know, Williams and Sonoma. Williams and Sonoma, they do a lot of business in stores, but they get over 50% of the revenues online now. And so, you know, how do we think about that? And typically they think about that in the same way that we think about how an existing store is going to do in future years. You know, that, uh, well, you know, the store did you know, 10, 10 million in sales last year. Um, seems like the economy is going to be pretty good. So maybe it's going to grow 4% this year, basically some sort of benchmark for same store sales growth. But you know, it's like, okay, so so how how are those sales coming about and where are we getting that 4% number from? And you know, typically it's, again, it's some sort of very top-down way of thinking about the world. This is to say, um, you can keep you know, thinking in a top-down way, but we still know that all the sales are coming from customers. And so um, you know, let, let's incorporate that into that, that model for, uh, for, for what the revenue is going to be next year. It's so interesting, the power of the marketing data in the world of, of finance. Um, you know, it, back to, you know, when I was at, at you know, in, in investment banking and I'd come out of, you know, I did marketing strategy for, I was a Booz Allen consultant focused on marketing intensive companies. And I saw the power in understanding the customer, but it wasn't something that was valued uh, in the same way that it is, that it is today. Um, this kind of whole idea of customer centricity and yet understanding, you know, what a financial person might call unit economics can provide so much more insight about the health of a business model. And I want to ask you about Blue Apron, because I know that's a company that you've looked at in great detail. And what you saw that I think some of the public markets missed is such a good example, I think, of the power of CBCV. So could you share a little bit about the you know, Blue Apron story? Yes, this was back, I think it was uh, early June 2017, and I had just finished defending my dissertation. Obviously, my dissertation topic was customer-based corporate <laughs> valuation, um, and it was uh, it's kind of like you have this hammer and you start looking for nails, and uh, and someone had had asked the question, you know, over Twitter actually, you know, so what do you think about Blue Apron? And um, yeah, I didn't have uh, kids at that time. Again, I just finished dissertation, I was like, why the heck not? I'm just going to dive in and see, see what's in there. Um, and what was interesting was there was no, no measures of customer churn in the filing, uh, but they did provide some really interesting data about how customers monetize over time. And uh, you know, basically there was kind of a moment where I was like, you know, uh, we should be able to run a model on this. You know, we should be able to take this methodology 
and just port it over to to Blue Apron's data. And so um, when I did, uh, there were kind of two main conclusions that kind of popped out of that. You know, the first was that their customer retention was not so good. They had something like 70% of their customers churning after six months. And it's hard to build a durable business when um, you know, basically you kind of have to reinvent yourself every year uh, or every 15 months, <laughs> technically. Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of conclusion number one. Uh, conclusion number two was in the run-up to the IPO, they started to spend a lot more money on marketing. And, and obviously that was spurring on revenue growth and, and customer growth, but not to the same extent that it was before. So, uh, so basically, you know, I, I had concluded that their customer acquisition cost was rising very rapidly and it had gone from, you know, call it $60 per customer to more like a hundred or $110 per customer. And if you just think about unit level profitability and how, you know, how that changes when you've kind of almost double the amount that's spent to acquire customers, that can really change the game. And I think what they were trying to do was they were trying to, to hit certain key trophy metrics. It just so happened that the quarter right before the IPO was the very first time they had a million active customers. And uh, there's just something really nice about a million. So I think as they were doing that, they were potentially actually destroying value at the end. You know, which uh, obviously that that's that's really not good, even though it is creating revenue growth. I love this story, of course, and not just because you know Blue Apron, of course, is a subscription business. Your your customer based corporate valuation is not limited to subscriptions, but the relationship with subscription businesses I find so useful. And of course, Blue Apron is a subscription business. It's a, a meal kit which, with very high variable costs because. You know, you're not you're not sending out streaming content or access to software. You're sending out boxes filled with food that have shipping costs. And yeah. you know what I what I found so interesting about your analysis about Blue Apron and the way I looked at it was they were you know as you said they were spending more and more on acquisition. So basically, they were giving people free meals to experience their offering. And people were taking that. So they had very high acquisition costs because they were actually giving away food and shipping it to people. And, you know, the more you give away, the longer, the more months you need to be guaranteed that somebody's going to stay. Let's call that, you know, if they needed to stay, let's say seven months, but the, they're not getting profitable until, you know, they're, they're leaving after six months, but it takes seven months to get to profitability. You can see that they're effectively losing money on every new customer. This is not, as you said, a durable model. It's not, it's not a profitable model. It's not about scaling up. It just doesn't make sense if, if you really have to spend that much to acquire somebody. But if you're looking at it in aggregate, what you see is we put money in for acquisition and we got customers out the other side. And the revenue number, that that big revenue number didn't tell the story of how people were churning out. Um, and what, you know, whether or not each individual customer is profitable. So I feel like there's a lesson there for the operator and there's a lesson there for the investor. For the investor, it's, you know, as you point out, trophy metrics aren't always the best, you know, they're, they're not, they're not, the, they're not the most reliable. If you tell somebody what, what the metric is that you care about, they'll do everything they can to hit that metric. Even if, as you say, it destroys the rest of the of the uh, business model. And I think for the company, it's really important, especially in a subscription business, to start by making sure that your unit economics work, that you know that if you bring in a new customer, they're going to stay long enough to justify the cost of acquisition. Before you, you know, what I think of as turn on your marketing loudspeaker and try to bring a lot more, a lot more customers in. No, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, I think that uh, for for investors, yeah, if you knew nothing else about a company except that their revenues were growing a hundred percent a year, well, you know, growing a hundred percent a year is better than growing twenty percent a year. But but all else is not equal, <laughs> and uh, and we need to take into account, you know, all all revenue is not equal, and um, and yeah, you, you mentioned the example of a software as a service firm. Yeah, typically, a business is like that. When they acquire customers, 
uh, the following year, oftentimes they make more in revenue from that cohort than the previous year. And that's very, very, very far from the truth with, you know, B2C businesses in general, but specifically Mielke companies. And the, the software as a service firms typically are, are generating, you know, gross margins of 80%, 85%, and not, you know, 25%, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, that makes a world of difference. Yeah, which, you know, is another really important point, I think, for, for subscription entrepreneurs who are, are listening to this discussion, you know, doing a subscription box just of any kind is much harder than a subscription to digital digital goods, you know, digital services or uh, digital content because you have such high variable costs because you have to, you know, ship the product and you have to buy the product. It's each new widget, you, you still have to pay for it. And, you know, I, I spoke last year, I think you've also spoken at um, one of the big subscription box conferences. And I feel like a lot of them underestimate those, those costs and how difficult it is to generate profit and also how difficult it is to retain a customer for long enough for you to really enjoy the benefits of, of subscription, which as you pointed out in the world of software is that, that long tail, that long relationship from that initial marketing spend, right? That, they, that you, you catch them once and you keep them forever. Yeah, so I think you know you're absolutely right that that there are big implications for businesses over and above the fact that obviously businesses want to be mindful of how investors are going to think about them because ultimately to the extent that these businesses need capital, they need to raise money, um they're going to need to speak to those investors. <laughs> and so <laughs> good to, you know, know how the investors are thinking about them and what the report card might look like. But yeah, even holding that aside, I think just as as an operator you can think of things like retention and customer acquisition cost as uh, you know, kind of measures of product market fit. And um, if you know that you're not able to you know, retain most of your customers after some reasonably short period of time, there's something about the business model that may require improving. Um, so I think about it similarly to kind of how you were describing it as well. When we when we think about acquisition costs and, and you know, how it makes sense to kind of structure the business, really what a lot of this work will you know, kind of imply is it really matters how much value you're able to get from customers after they've been acquired. And yeah. if you're able to get $300 of marginal profit for every acquired customer, you're doing really well. Yeah, you know, that that's that that's a very a very good level to be operating from because that means that obviously uh, in the early days when you're getting a lot of your customers organically or through word of mouth, your CAC is going to be zero. But you know, as you grow- CAC in, is- um, oh, Sorry, customer acquisition cost. Yeah. Uh, as you grow in scale, you're not going to be able to get all your customers coming into organic channels or word of mouth anymore. And uh, you're going to be rotating into- you know, pay channels. So you're going to pay for things like Facebook ads and Google ads, probably. And, and those channels get pricey. Um, and that doesn't mean your business is bad. It just is you know, the cost of doing business at scale, oftentimes. Um, the cost of acquisition goes up most of the, you know, you want to think that you'll get more efficient at acquisition. But if you're, if you're relying on pay channels, your cost of acquisition will go up. It only goes down if you're getting word of mouth kind of growth as, a, as opposed to, um, you know, paid channels. Yeah, I'd say the other area where oftentimes, you know, CAC may generally move down are marketplace businesses where there's some sort of network effect that can be exploited. And just the fact that you have a lot more people on the platform, a lot more people in the market will make it so much more appealing to potential prospects. You know, that to say, can you, know, you give an example of one of those kinds of businesses that saw their um, CAC go down as a result of growth on the platform and a network effect? Uh, so we had done work on a company called Farfetch. And for them, uh, their, their CAC had, had gone down over time modestly, which again, just kind of bucks the trend. Uh, another company actually that we had done work on was, was Lyft. You know, they're kind of classic ride sharing service. Now, certainly, you know, with Lyft, the unit economic picture, it looked okay, but not great. 
and certainly they were um, IPOing at a really high valuation. So we ended up you know, kind of being a bit negative on their valuation, but uh, but it wasn't because their CAC was moving up. Uh, their, their CAC was you know, very marketplace-like that um, it came from kind of higher level and then, and then moved to a lower level. So, so just to summarize, with Lyft, as they started and people didn't know about them and there weren't enough drivers out on the road to give people confidence that they should use it, getting each new rider was very expensive. But over time, as there were more, more Lyft cars available and more of your kind of friends knew that it, what it was, it became easier for people to find out about it and have faith in it and sign up. So the cost went down. That's exactly right. Yeah. With a marketplace, typically in its infancy, oftentimes it's going to try and lubricate the market on both sides. It's going to provide incentives to both the buyers and the sellers, you know, the riders and the the people doing the rides. And, yeah. um, and, and that's going to cause the CAC to be higher. Uh, but, you know, once you, once you become a verb, you know, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to Uber Rubble now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then uh, obviously that, that's going to create the word of mouth that you need to, uh, to not have to spend nearly as much money, which will make the unit economics a lot better. So the message is for people listening is that um, you should really think logically about, you can probably anticipate which way your cost of acquisition is going to go over time, depending on whether you're counting on word of mouth or a network effect because um, you have some kind of a, of a platform, or whether you're going to continue to acquire new customers through you know, more traditional kinds of advertising, paid, paid outreach. And, and that will help both you as an operator uh, anticipate your costs, but also if you're an investor and you're trying to understand you know, what some you know, prospective investment, what some entrepreneur is telling you about the, you know, when they kind of spit shine their business, these are good questions to ask, to try to understand what do you expect your CAC to be? How confident are you in terms of the lifetime value of each new customer who, who signs up? How are you tracking that? Those are the kinds of questions that might get you better data to make a more informed assessment of the value of the business. Yep, that's right. Yeah, if you're, again, going back to the, the, the subscription box example, yeah. If you um, if you're going to pitch me that you know, your business is great and you're basically turning a your customers are worth a hundred dollars after they've been acquired and you're not spending anything on paid marketing, you know, so your CAC is zero, you will be profitable. But mm -hmm. but I know for sure as soon as you start trying to scale that, you know, you're probably going to move from zero to seventy, eighty, and and that's going to really erode the the incremental profitability of your customers. So, you know, so CLV, yeah, obviously all of this customer is customer lifetime value. Yeah, it's just all basically customer lifetime value, but it's it's also kind of this um, this decomposition of customer lifetime value into what I call the customer acquisition costs, which is what you spend to get the people in the door, and the amount of value that you get after the after they're acquired. You know, what I call the the post acquisition value. And so being able to kind of see see where those numbers have been, how they've been evolving, you know, how the the marketing budget's been evolving, and then just knowing kind of given the nature of the business and where it's looking to go, how those should move in the future, I think that can give you a very good, you know, kind of prior view of of how that business is going to do. It's more complex or more nuanced, I think, than a lot of people understand. I, I wanted to ask you about, you know, we're, we're, this is June of 2020, you know, some of us are on, you know, third or fourth month of, of, you know, restricted movement, uh, sheltering in place. What have you seen in terms of the impact of that on your model and how well your model can incorporate these kinds of disruptions of revenue and dramatic changes in customer behavior? Yeah, I think the way that you framed it was right. That uh, you know, basically, it's kind of these this dramatic disruption. That obviously, if we were uh, sitting here in January of 2020, you know, our our model will not predict that. You know, we we take historical data, we use it to predict the future. I think as we have worked our way through it, um, 
it's a framework like this that can really allow us to understand how these companies are, are doing and be able to answer questions like, you know, is the, the drop in revenues at a particular company because the company is no longer acquiring new customers, but the existing customers are doing okay? Or you know, is it more broad based than that? And you know, being able to have those diagnostic conclusions about where the weakness is coming from can have definite implications for how that business is going to kind of muddle its way back, you know, as we kind of move our way slowly but surely you know, back towards some sort of a new normal. I would say the the impact that COVID has had on consumer behavior has been so randomly different for different types of companies where there's been some narrative about, you know, it's just kind of a great acceleration of what was already in place. And, you know, obviously the trend towards digital had been in place before and now it's just continued to accelerate. But it seems a little too pat to me. You know, I think that there's uh, still significant variation where it wasn't even really due to any fault of a particular company that they might have gotten completely hosed right. by COVID. You know, even to the point of, well, you know, uh, we sold shirts, so we did a bit better. You know, we, we sold underwear <laughs> and thus we're not there on the Zoom camera, you know, so right. we didn't. Right, shoes aren't um, doing well. Well, and you have, you know, some very... You know, hyper synchronized omni channel strategy. Well, all those stores are sucking wind, whereas the the company that really wasn't trying and just sold e commerce only, you know, they're, they're sitting much right. prettier now. There was now. A, a good dose of luck, I think, in in this one. There, are, you know, things that you can't predict. It. I mean, what it does to theme parks and and hospitality versus, you know, like you said, e commerce and how you know. King Arthur Flower is having a field day because everybody's staying home making bread. You know, you, yeah, it's just yeah. crazy. Home improvement's been, you know, much more resilient, you know, because people are now at home and they say, oh, darn, you know, I, I need a better chair for my home office. And uh, was that because they knew it was coming all along? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is just kind of a random fluke that because people are at home, you know, the mix of, of products that they need uh, has, has significantly yeah. changed. So- so yeah, I think that um, yeah, certainly there's going to be an element where we're just going to need to kind of properly control for what's going to be more temporary, and I think you know what's going to be more likely to persist into the future. So I think that the the CBCV framework could be a very helpful way of of being able to to see that play out. But I think that there is going to be an element that we'll need another another handful of months to really tell what's going to be more transitory and, and what's going to be a bit more, you know, more permanent. Okay. I, um, we're, we're just wrapping up and I, I have some fun questions for you. What advice do you have for um, entrepreneurs as someone who has started multiple companies? Oh, that's a great question. I think knowing what you're good at and knowing where, where your competence ends is extremely important. I know for myself, I thrive when I'm the geek in the back room. I really don't thrive when I'm kind of the the day to day leader who's calling all the shots. And that's just that's not not an environment that I do well in. And I don't think I make those decisions particularly <laughs> well. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so, so it's not that you wouldn't want to to you wouldn't want to start a business. I, obviously, I've started too, but it it can really help inform the composition of the team and the composition of the skill sets of those team members. That's wise. And then in terms of your advice for uh, academics who are thinking about, you know, kind of straddling between their research and the, the commercial side. That's a hard one. Uh, typically, in general, I'd recommend that academics don't do it, actually. There's a lot of things that are, are good about it, you know, that you get access to great data Oftentimes you hear these really interesting problems, and so it can help spur on what might be the next great academic paper that you write. Uh, but oftentimes it can encourage kind of quick and dirty ways of solving problems that it's like, yeah, yeah, this is like the 70% solution that gets it done right now versus the 100% solution that takes you know a full year to do. Um, oftentimes to get a paper published in a top tier academic journal, it's more the latter type of paper that's going to end up succeeding. And so, and so having to kind of think about the problem solving decision in these very different ways, um, yeah, I think that can, um, 
just lead to to bad muscle memory. <laughs> it's like two different, you have two different goals. Okay, so last little bit. Um, I have a speed round for you. Uh, so just answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. What was the first subscription you ever had? Oh, that's actually a really good question. I don't know if I have a... <laughs> <laughs> It might be something like digital news subscription, I'm thinking. Okay. Um, your favorite subscription today? Geek Answer Crunchyroll. Uh, it's an yeah. anime. Oh, yeah. yeah, anime. Yeah, I know that one. Um, a very well-run uh, subscription. Your superpower? My superpower, being a random geek and, and being unabashedly proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> what do your colleagues hate and love about working with you? Uh, what do my colleagues hate about working with me? Um, I am kind of idiosyncratic. So yeah, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Uh, so that, that can swing both ways when, um, you know, you're working with other, other human beings. <laughs> <laughs> and then in terms of what, what they love about working with me, I'm certainly I'm kind of a, a zero or 150% sort of a guy. And so when I'm really into something, I, I really try and carry my weight. And you kind of take take it all the way to the finish line. So, you know, hopefully that uh, hopefully that benefits everyone who's involved. Yeah, that makes for a good colleague. Uh, and then, what is the one thing that you want? The, you know, the subscription entrepreneurs and practitioners who are listening to this conversation. What is the one thing you'd like them to take away? The one thing I I would like them to take away is to think very thoughtfully about unit economics and. Don't ignore the growing body of, of, of evidence for why it matters for their ultimate valuation. Uh, you really can't escape it. So you might as well be upfront about it and use it as a tool to be the heat-seeking missile that you use to measure and manage the value of your company over time. Unit economics are the underloved and so important uh, data uh, for, for most entrepreneurs. Uh, great point. Um, so thank you very much, Dan McCarthy, for spending time with me and sharing your wisdom on subscription stories. Well, thank you for having me. And yeah, hopefully we'll get a chance to, to pair up again sometime soon. I know you mentioned that the CFO piece, obviously that was one that, that we done together <laughs> and I had a lot of fun doing that. So yeah, looking forward to hopefully the next one sometime yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah, me too. I look forward to collaborating again soon. Thanks for listening, everyone. This has been Subscription Stories. Today, I was talking with Dan McCarthy of Emory University's Goizueta Business School. To hear more success stories of entrepreneurs creating their forever transaction in this new and exciting membership economy, subscribe to my podcast wherever you download your podcasts. Also, if you like what you're hearing, please give us a rating and review. They mean so much. Thanks for listening and for your support. To learn more about Dan, go to Daniel Min, that's M-I-N-H, McCarthy.com. I'm Robbie Kelman-Baxter. Baxter.